Let's go ahead and get started this evening. We'll start off with some singing. Before we do that, if you were to get your phones out, and let's go ahead and share, if you can, the Facebook feed from our church's page so that we can be a blessing to those around us on our friends list and those on our community. Let's all stand. We'll start by singing, The Windows of Heaven Are Open. All together on the first. Ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are open. change he's made on the first ready what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since jesus came into my heart so for which long i have sought since jesus came into my heart since jesus came into
one more time, that second verse. Look at the words of that. And my sins, which were many, not some, not a part, but they're all washed away, man. Aren't you glad that he puts them in the depths of the sea? I heard a preacher one time say this, that we have some Christians at times that are scuba diving. When Jesus buries them in the sea, we go and try to dig them up. Amen. And so let's think about that and the forgiveness of the Lord as we sing that again. Ready? I have ceased from my point and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. back to our seats. Let's sing through. God can do anything. God can do anything but fail. Ready? God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save. He can cleanse. He can keep any will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning. sing this one more time, but this time like we mean it. Amen. Like we mean it. Ready? God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, he can, he can keep and he will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the God can do anything. 
but you may be seated and good to see you here tonight. Hey, we have a missionary on the way. Brother Bisler is. He's, uh, we've known him for several years, but he's coming from Dothan, Alabama. And uh, he texted this afternoon, said, I'm going to be a few minutes late. And now he just texted Brother Tim and said, I'll be about 30 minutes late. So if you have testimonies tonight, we'll share some testimonies and blessings before he gets here, okay? Hopefully he'll get here on time. Hey, guys, need to, one of you come help me with this. Uh, brother, if you were at the, fellow, preach, uh, the fellowship over in the Rager Hall uh, Sunday night at church, boy, though, wasn't that a great time? I think we had like 120 people there and uh, tons of food. Uh, you, everyone did a great, great job in that. But uh, Brother Derek, we had the little transitioning from Brother Wright uh, working with the teenagers and transitioning to Brother Aaron taking over. And so Brother Wright was uh, talking about different things. And he said, uh, when I was thinking about coming back, I uh, called the boss. And I thought, well, okay. He's going to say what I told him. And he said, I called Joy. <laughs> <laughs> and I called Melissa. <laughs> so I guess I'm third on the list, all right? So Melissa has a birthday coming up, and so this is for you, Melissa. And so somebody wrote the boss on there. I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> all right. Appreciate her, amen. Hey, let me give you several things to pray about. Uh, so listen up on, on all of it, but especially on this. You know, talking about the condition of our nation and what's going on in some of the states with some of the churches. Uh, I mentioned to you the last couple of services about Brother uh, Jack, uh, Brother Treber out in California and uh, being fine there. Uh, just got the award this morning. He, he, he made a post and said uh, uh, they've been fined $52,000 over the last nine days for having church. Now, no telling what the outcome of that's going to be, but uh, I'm sure good lawyers will step in and, and uh, get it under control. But it's amazing that in America, let me tell you this right fast, and I don't want to get too far on it, off on it, but I read something today uh, out of Chicago. Now, there's just, like I said the, the other day, Maine is making them get permission, putting a badge on the front of the church after they're, uh, uh, they're approved to have services. A uh, pastor up in uh, Virginia was arrested for having six more people than he's supposed to have in church. Uh, this one's out of Chicago, and it's a Pentecostal church, but this, this pastor came out of Romania. Here's what he's saying. Now, listen to this. And you better, better, better pick up on this and make it a serious matter of prayer. He said, I lived in Romania under communist rule. And he said, the, the same thing that happened in Romania is happening in America. And he said, the, the first thing they went after when they took over was uh, to, uh, to get a hold of the churches and do everything they could to stop them. If the churches didn't comply to them, they would bulldoze them down and get rid of them. And uh, you see that even with this pandemic thing, that, uh, that the pressure there. So he, now he's, uh, he left and came to America, and he's pastoring a church there in Chicago with Romanian people. And uh, he said we uh, complied with the, with the uh, requirements until they started letting everything else open up. You could have all kinds of other activities with large groups, but you only could have 10 in church. So he said, we decided we're just going to have church. And we roped everything off and was doing social distancing. Uh, had everything clean professionally, and uh, was having church, and they began to threaten them uh, with all kinds of things. The last part of it, here, listen to this, this is in Chicago, the mayor of Lightfoot kept hounding them and hounding them and hounding them and hounding them, and uh, the last part of it was, we'll take over the church and bulldoze it down. Now, that's in America. Can you imagine that... Uh, that, you know, churches have to deal with that kind of thing. Now, thank God we live in Florida, amen? amen. <laughs> uh, and we have the kind of governor and leadership that we have. But pray for the churches across the country. Brother uh, Treber out there, different ones, having a real difficult time. And then listen up on this, please, also uh, for prayer. Uh, Brother Randy Ford down in uh, Whitney Baptist uh, has a dear friend. that we, I've preached for him several times. He's been up here. Uh, just a great, great guy. He, uh, he's a diabetic, and he's had problems with his feet for a long, long period of time. The last time I was there, he had a ramp and in a, in a motorized uh, scooter getting up on the platform and all. But uh, just found out today that uh, next Tuesday, he's going to, he's, 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 he's done all kinds of things trying to uh, heal the foot with, because of the, uh, what do I call it? Uh, uh, say it again. Diabetes. <laughs> I'm trying to put the wrong word in there. But anyway, they're going to have to amputate his leg from the knee down, below the knee down, okay? So pray for him. Uh, that'll be next Tuesday, okay? All right, then here's another one to pray for. Uh, Miss Melissa sent out an email, so hopefully many of you got this. There's a family up in Pennsylvania that is moving down this weekend, 
and uh, Brother David, he has six children. And uh, when he's, he's been, talk, been talking to me the last three or four weeks about moving down. And uh, Miss Margaret, he's going to be your neighbor, not in your same subdivision, but the next one there. And so uh, he's been asking us to pray about the housing and everything working out. And so he called me about three days ago and said, uh, uh, the, the housing has been approved. Now, he works for UPS. He's transferring to Jacksonville uh, with UPS. But he said, uh, they're asking me for my first week's uh, paycheck, a copy of it. He said, well, I'm not even there yet, and I'm not going to start back to work. He's leaving this weekend, coming down. But he said, I'm not going to start to work until for another two, till the 14th. And so they're trying to work out the details of, uh, of you know, just going back on his paycheck there in Pennsylvania. So they're, they're going to be leaving Saturday, heading this way. So pray that everything will work out. I talked to him again yesterday. He said, looks like they're going to be able to work it out so we can move into the house. Uh, I scared a couple of people and got them praying hard. I said, if they don't get the house open, they're going to be moving in with Shermans. And so Brother Sherman said, <laughs> no. Uh, but they have six children, and they're from uh, the ages of 17 down to 7. And so uh, they want to get the kids in school here. And so uh, pray for David Hyatt, H-E-C-H-T, German, I guess, okay? All right, and then let's see. Pray for our nation, pray for leaders, pray for our churches, as I said. Uh, Brother Edmonds is in the hospital having to start on dialysis. So pray for him and Mrs. Uh, Edmonds. It's going to be tough on both of them. Brother Russell Fountain, uh, Pat and Barbara talked to uh, Pat today. Uh, Barbara's still in Mayo, so keep praying for her. The RU is, it starts up pretty quickly. And then let's see, we have a, uh, well, let me get, get to that last, okay? Uh, hey, listen up on this, and if you would uh, participate in it. I did a little video uh, this week on the, uh, the importance of, uh, of voting and the fact that we're going to have voters registration these next three Sundays. And it's probably, what, three or four minutes, something like that at the most. And uh, Melissa has it on Facebook and uh, on the church website, right? Uh, if you would, get on Facebook and share that uh, with, with your friends. Uh, we need to get everybody registered to vote. Amen? The, I tell you, this, this upcoming uh, election is going to be the most crucial one in your lifetime. Uh, there is a hatred on the radical left side uh, for America and for churches and for the things of God. And if we don't win this election, this may be the last election we'll ever get. But if we don't win this one, we're in trouble. So uh, do everything you can. Get that uh, little clip about uh, off of Facebook and share it and try to get everybody here that, that you can that's not registered to vote, okay? All right. Now we're going to have prayer right fast and we'll do that, okay? Brother Pete has a uh, – where would Brother Pete go? Oh, okay. You have something you want to share, right? Okay. We'll do that in a minute. Okay, let's pray together. Father, now thank you for your love to us. Lord, thank you for the good mercy that you have upon us here in Calvary and in Florida. And God, I can't imagine what it's like there in Chicago or up in Maine or there in Virginia or out in California. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd be merciful in all of these situations. Help the, help the ones that are uh, taking the aggressive stand uh, to be bold about it, not back down, not give in. God, help good lawyers to get in there and work with them and help them. And I pray you'd be merciful and protect them. God, have mercy upon our nation. Have mercy upon our leaders. Help them to do right. Help them to be a, a God-fearing people, a God-honoring people. I pray that you'd be merciful. Now bless our churches around our country. Uh, bless our nation. Bless our leaders. Uh, Father, these that are struggling and hurting, I pray you'd be merciful there. Thank you for every good gift that you give us. Now bless tonight all that goes on. May the Lord Jesus be glorified and honored. And we'll praise you for what you do in Christ's name. Amen. All right, who's going to be the runner? All right. Jack is coming to the runner. So here's the first one. We have a dear homeless lady with us tonight. And she wants to share a testimony. <laughs> Mrs. Latham has sold her house. And uh, I said, I'm going to call you a homeless lady. And she is. But she is, she is excited about it. Listen up. It's definitely true. I am homeless. <laughs> but maybe not for long. But I tell you, I'm so excited tonight. I, I'm going to try to calm myself down because y'all know I can be radical because I truly believe and know 
that I have a personal relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. Amen. I just know that with all my heart and soul. Amen. And I'm, he's changed my life. He's changed everything about me. And uh, I'm, I can be radical, and I, I don't apologize <laughs> for that, but I do try to calm myself down around different people that don't want to hear it. I'm not because I'm ashamed, because I really want to be around them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll start off with uh, the fact that um, I wanted to sell my beautiful home right here. I've even locked my... I lost my keys and walked over before, and I loved it. But I know that God directs our steps. I know that with all my heart and soul because the Bible's tr truth. And so um, my children wanted me to move on the piece of land over by them, which is Sarah and her husband, my son, and my other son and my uh, oldest granddaughter. But um, I, I just wasn't ready for that yet, and I, and I just felt led to buy over here in this uh, development. And... Um, and I'm glad I did because I found I met a, uh, a lot of different uh, friends there. My the cop neighbor right next door, he just says, "Miss Margaret, you're 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 a family, you know, just come anytime." So, but anyway, so I uh, had basically um, bought my house and paid cash, and then I foolishly bought a new car and paid cash. So I just really made myself really tight in my um, day, in my monthly living and stuff. So. I, after a while, I just decided it would be uh, better if I just go ahead and sell out and downsize, literally downsize. And um, so I made plans for that, and so I did that, and that's why I'm homeless is because that sold. And I was so excited because I kept wondering why God isn't my house selling. You know, it was put on the market in November, and uh, it's really hard to keep your house uh, presentable for someone to walk through at any time almost. And then I have had my realtor call and say, Miss Margaret, somebody's in your neighborhood and they want to show your house. They can be there in 10 minutes. And I have had that happen. And I do have my grandchildren, great-grandchildren uh, over a lot, so it's really hard. But so I, um, I just decided that I would... Um, go ahead and sell and get myself a little bit more financially stable because I do love to give. I love to give to the, um, I love to buy the Jesus films. I love to give and uh, to the um, to the missionaries and different things like that. So anyway, so the lady that I sold my home to, she, she walked through and she said, I'm waiting on the missionary, right? I can talk, <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> waiting on the missionary, remember that. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, when she walked through my house, she went to the bathroom, master bath, and I have a big, about this big, and a butterfly um, shelf hanging on my wall. It's white, it's a butterfly with shelves in it. And when she came out, she asked me, what is my attraction to butterflies? I says, I have none. I said, I've seen this at um, Kohl's. I had some Kohl bucks, if y'all know anything about Kohl's. And this was very expensive. I would have never paid money for it, but I paid cold butts, bucks for it. And um, so she says, well, my attraction is I had my first granddaughter was born um, de, um, uh, not well. She has had uh, tubing feeds from the time she was born, and she, we've had to feed her through her tubes ever since she was born, and she never really developed and, and, and grew right and, and matured right. Well, they lost her at like two, I think, two or three years old, she died. So she says when she, she, when they, when she died, that her, her, she herself went and got a butterfly tattoo on her ankle. So she said, that's my attraction to butterflies. So um, I had naturally, you know, witnessed to them and whatever. So when she came over to the house and she was the owner of the house, her children came with her. She had married two married sons and a, two daughters that are not married. And um, so I says, I left the butterfly for you. And she was really touched. And she, her daughter says, oh, that's all she's been talking about the whole time is Miss Margaret's butterfly. So um, I just feel like that, that God just touches people in the way we treat them, the way we act, you know. I really didn't have any attraction to the butterfly. It done its done its purpose at the house. And um, maybe the double wide might not even be big enough for it. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I'm going to, um, I've I ordered her a um, personally made wreath at her front door with butterflies. Wow. And um, so um, I invited them to church, and she's supposed to enroll her third grade third grader third grader over here to school and then she has a child uh, daughter that just graduated last year 
And um, I invited them to church and stuff. So when we left the signing of everything, when her, her grand, I mean, her oldest daughter says, um, I'm coming to church. I'm, a, I'm coming to church like that. I said, good. I said, you'll love the church. And I talked to her about that a, a bit. So that's why I didn't sell my house to anybody else. I feel like that with all my heart and soul. Amen. And now then when I went to, I went several uh, times during the, um, t- we're still waiting on that missionary, right? <laughs> hey, hey Pete's, Pete's giving a testimony afterwards, so we got to cut it short. <laughs> Uh-oh, I won't never be this long. Before. But so um, I went several times to look for mobile homes th- mm. throughout this time, and I even went as far as Lake City, and we, you know, we have mobile home sales here too. I went um, one time before or twice before out to um, McClenny to a mobile home sales. And then I ended back up at Ms. McClenny uh, a couple of days ago, met this precious, precious, precious lady named Misty, M-I-S-T-I, Misty. And she's a sold out, a born again believer. And she and I, I walked in her office at 11.35 and I left at three. <laughs> we did more praising God and, and Bible uh, swapping and um, blessing swapping. And she says, I want you to come with me. And I says, okay. <laughs> and so she took me over to the mobile home that I had chosen right off of the lot. And we had prayer. And we prayed for our, um, my children. And I told her how my heart was so burdened that I want to make God take um, have, save my children because I don't want them to die and go to hell. So we went over there and, we, and she prayed for my, uh, for my children. And, and uh, we claimed it and we prayed. <clears throat> We thank God for his uh, answering our prayers and stuff like that. So that's why I went to all the different mobile home uh, places and I ended up with Missy. So uh, I'm sort of on cloud nine tonight because she way ra- way more radical than me. <laughs> amen. Okay, thank you. Amen. Margaret's such a sweet lady. She loves the Lord, amen. All right, let's see. Anybody else try fast before Brother Pete uh, takes one minute? Give her, Brother Pete. Brother Pete told me he had to have he had to say something tonight. So let's hear what it is. I will try to keep it short. Okay. okay. I have a brother-in-law, and I've mentioned him, brought him up in prayer to the church. He was married to my sister for 32 years. She left him. He didn't leave. He got remarried a year or so later. Her name is Margaret. She went on to be with the Lord April 1st, 37 and 32 years of marriage. He is a Christian. They had her services. Do we wonder if God still does miracles? I'll tell you what I think is a miracle. He shared it with me out at the grave site the pastor was getting ready to speak and all were gathered around and he said right at the very moment the pastor started to speak a solid white dove came down and lit on the end of the casket Hmm. said that white dove stayed there the entire time Hmm said it would look at the pastor and it would look at him for the entire time of the graveside services. If that's not a miracle from God saying how much he loved her and that she's with him, I don't know what else you could call a miracle. Amen. Amen. All right, someone else want to share a blessing? Raise your hand right fast. Jack, we'd be glad to run to you. All right. Uh, Brother Prince uh, spoke last Wednesday on prayer in chapel. And as I was sitting there, the Lord was dealing with my heart for maybe starting a prayer group during the uh, school time for the teenagers. And so I began trying to figure out while he was talking, how would it best work, you know? And maybe I could get Brother Prince on board. And so... Afterwards, I spoke with him and Miss Brandy and Brother Tim, and we decided to start a prayer meeting um, several days a week and invite the teenagers. And we've been 
doing it now for one week and have had uh, several teenagers come each morning to pray for about 20 minutes in the morning. And it's been a blessing to my heart to see, uh, to be honest with you, kids that I didn't think would want to come, uh, come and take it seriously and uh, give prayer requests. And it's been a blessing to my heart um, how the Lord's been working in those meetings each morning. And um, I hope they continue and that it grows as well. Amen. Amen. Brother Tim, why don't you say a word about uh, today's chapel and uh, invite others to come, the time and all. Okay, give it, Brother Tim. As we do our chapel each uh, week uh, here on Wednesday mornings at 8.30, we always have uh, some of our teachers that will preach. Some weeks we'll have outside youth pastors and pastors that will come preach. And then uh, this morning had Brother Owen uh, come and preach at 8.30. And his wife made him take off work all day and be there with us. But uh, he did a great job. He preached about uh, the foolish man in the book of Proverbs and how that a foolish man won't listen. And as I sat there and listened to him preach to the young people, you know, I thought how practical that is to the generation of young people, not just young people, everybody, when they're given instruction and won't uh, heed and... Uh, it was just a great, great message. The young people listen really well. And if you ever like to either watch from home, we put it on the uh, Facebook Live with the uh, Calvary Christian Academy. You can watch our Wednesday chapel on that. Or you can, you know, you can be here and sit in the back and listen to the preaching uh, each Wednesday. But it's been a good uh, start to our school year. We're having uh, September the 14th and 15th, a youth pastor from Denellen, Florida, come up and preach four times to the kids. We normally, at the beginning of the school year, have what we call back-to-school revival, and we rent a campground. But because of COVID, we're not going to do that this year. But we are going to vacate all of our classes for that day, for those two days, Monday, Tuesday, the 14th and 15th. They're going to play games in the morning time, in the afternoon time, have Bible quizzes and so forth. And then every morning, uh, we're having a chapel service. I think that's 845 in the morning. I'll have to give you the exact date uh, times that later. And then it's one o'clock, I think, in the afternoon. So uh, Brother uh, Nate Pitts, the youth pastor at Donellan, is going to preach to the young people every day. And if you'd like to come be a part of that as well for those two days, just, uh, you know, it's good to see our school growing numerically, but all of it's in vain if we don't grow closer to the Lord and don't see young people that are not saved get saved. We've had, I, I may be wrong about this exact number, but we've had, I think, six of our young people, maybe seven since the beginning of the school year, trust Christ as their Savior. Amen. So that's, that's what it's all about. Amen. And our chapel's in here on Wednesday morning. First time, we, we've always had it over in the Rager Hall, but the school's too large now, <clears throat> so we can't have it there. So it's in here every Wednesday morning at 8.30. You're certainly welcome to come. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Bring it over on this side. Hello. <laughs> um, I just want to say that um, it's been such a blessing being able to teach this year. And Brother Tim Preacher's been really kind to me with my health. And I went to the doctor today, and um, my blood work is the best it's ever been. Amen. And so I don't, I don't know why. I'm assuming that's just God's blessing for maybe trusting him. Um, he lowered my steroids that I'm taking daily, so that's a blessing. And... Um, Matt and I last week went back out on the bus route on Saturday. We um, went soul winning, and he was so kind to me. He said um, he knew I wasn't feeling good last week, and he said, Honey, you know, we're going to go out. If you feel like going, we'd love to have you. If not, and uh, after serving the Lord with him for 20 years, I was a little offended that he gave me an option. I said, Of course I'm going. Um, so I wasn't going to let my family go without me, and I went, and I knocked about one door to his 20 or 30 doors, but um, Luke was with me, and then I turned Luke over to him, but Luke and I were able to see a man get saved, and um, despite all the COVID and all, everything going on, it's just such a blessing to have some normalcy and be able to teach, you know, and my thought was, if I can stand and teach, then I can stand and tell somebody about the Lord, Amen. and I would like to say that I would love a lady to go out with me, because this one can run circles around me, and I don't do near as much, so if there's a lady that would like to go out and just knock, you know, a few doors with me on Saturday, that would be great. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Anyone else? Raise your hand if you want to. All right, bring it on back up. Let's have another song, okay?
Let's all stand once again. We'll sing, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour. On the first, most gracious Lord. I need thee every hour, O oh gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can keep me. I need thee, oh I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh bless me. Hello, more brother. We were start us off. Ready? I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Great singing. You may be seated. All right. Good to have you here, brother Miz. You made it. Hey. Come on, why don't you come on up and see Brother Tim and uh, let him get with you for a quick moment. And then, Brother Tim, why don't you get ready and come on up and go over some announcements. Let me just mention this right fast while they're talking. Uh, glad you, you came from Dothan, Alabama. Got here today. Glad you got here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> a week from this coming Saturday is going to be our first uh, Six Jeppers Fellowship that we've had in uh, quite some time, in several months because of being shut down with the virus. And so we need, we want to have a good, good crowd. So uh, everyone that can get with Mrs. Margaret, we're going to have fried fish. It's coming from uh, Cedar River. So uh, things that go along with the fried fish, be good with Mrs. Margaret. Let her know you'll be able to come. And uh, Brother Phil's going to preach for us. And his mom and dad are going to be here this weekend, right? And the following weekend. So they'll be there for the fellowship. And the whole family can come. You girls can come. I know you're not 60 uppers yet, but you can find out how, to, you can practice on how to act when you get our age. Amen? All right. Uh, but uh, come for that. We'll have a great time. Okay, that, that's a week from this coming Saturday. For the, for the gym. No. Okay. All right. Uh, there's also the same day as the 12th there. There's a teen movie night here at the church. And the time of that's five to seven. There's is there a cost to that, brother? No, no cost. And so if you have young people uh, or have uh, young people either in your family, on your bus route, so forth, uh, make sure you get them uh, out and be a part of that. And then don't forget, as preachers already mentioned, that the next two Sundays are Civic Sunday here at church and try to encourage people to be out, register to vote. And uh, let's pray God use us this week to make a big difference in our own community. If you're not a part of our regular visitation, soul winning on Saturday morning, uh, make sure you come out and be a part of that. That meets here at 9.30 on Saturday morning. And we have about a 30-minute meeting with a little breakfast. And then we head out the door and knock on doors and try to win people to Jesus. And uh, so let's pray God give us a good weekend this coming weekend. Come ahead, fellas. Let's take our evening offering. And it is good to see Brother Biz Reese here tonight. He's one of our good friends here at Calvary. And God's used him for many, many years in Dominican and Haiti. We thank the Lord for him being here. And here's his family coming in the door. We're glad.
glad, glad they rushed from Dothan, Alabama to be in church with us tonight. So a uh, long way, long haul over. And so thank God for them getting here safely. Let's pray for the offering. Lord, we sure love you. And we're thankful for the good grace of God upon our lives. Thank you for bringing the Larris family here with us tonight. We pray, Lord, you'd use what we do this evening, what we hear this evening to make us more like Jesus. And then, Lord, we would pray that you'd be with the ministry there in Haiti as well as in the Dominican that's been established, Lord, for the gospel's sake. We pray you'd meet the needs of the Larise family. We thank you again for their dedication love for the gospel. We pray you'd use this offering to spread the gospel of Jesus, not only here locally but around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. for that brother weaver let's all stand we'll sing one more song this evening revive us again our prayer revive us again we praise the O oh god on the first we praise the O oh god for the son of Let's try it a cappella, Brother Weaver. Raise our voices. Hey, the singing service is supposed to prepare your heart for God's word to be opened. So as we sing these songs, we're not wasting time. We're not trying to make you uncomfortable and awkward, but we're trying to prepare our hearts for God's word. And let's do that as we sing. Ready? Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Oh, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Great singing, maybe see. Dreaming 
someone said you can't go back home again and things will not ever be as good as they've been I've got good news for you when heaven comes into view one glimpse and you'll know the best is yet to come some call it heaven I call it home some call it dreaming well let me dream on some call it paradise somewhere beyond the skies some call it heaven I call it home some call it paradise somewhere Do you have a do you have a lapel mic on? Okay, good. Good to have you here tonight. And let's see the family. Wow, I think it's grown since I've seen you the last time. All right, what two, four, six? Is that right? Six children. Wow. Why don't you come up, take a couple of minutes, and tell us about the ministry, and then preach for us. All right. Glad to, glad you're here. Glad you're here. Lord bless you, man. Good day. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Well, I wanted to uh, uh, begin by expressing my apology to you. I wish I had my suit on and my tie on so I can look dignified like we a pleasure, <laughs> you know. But obviously, we drove from uh, Dothan, Alabama. Um, this morning, I had an appointment for my son, uh, BJ, my firstborn. Uh, he had his permit to drive, and then I wanted to make sure that he get his driver's license before we leave the U.S. And so I went in there, and we sat there for a long time and wait and wait, and finally, uh, the state trooper agent came out and told us that the computer system was down. So I had two choices, and the part of me wanted to say, well, I need to go, let's go, you know. But part of me also know we are on our way back to the Dominican Republic. He's 18. If we don't get it now, it's going to be maybe five more years before we come back. And so, you know, we sat, we waited, and praise the Lord. Uh, you know, the computer came back alive, I, I guess, you know. <laughs> And then so he was able to take his uh, driver's education test, and he passed. He had an A, B, B, and then so they gave him his license. Praise God. You know, so now he will be useful to me on the mission field, right? <laughs> I'm going to put him to work, you know, when he gets back, okay? And so it's, it truly is wonderful uh, to be here tonight. I'm a church planter, and I'm a missionary. I've been uh, in the, if you would, area of mission now for 19 years, almost 20 years, and I remember my first time when I came here, um, uh, Brother Pledger uh, was the first pastor in America that I heard was talking of the idea supporting national pastors, uh, working with national pastors. And in those days, I had a teacher from Bible College. His name was Doug Caleb, you know. And then he used to come here, do your mission conferences for you. And then he would come back to the college and says, you know, he says, uh, I came from uh, Middlesbrough, Florida. Uh, this guy named uh, uh, Pledger, he's talking about supporting national pastors. You know, he says, that's something new, you know. And then so, uh, to make a long story short, what he was promoting 19 years ago is actually the way to go. Amen. Truly. If you want to have an impact on the mission field, you need to reach out to the nationals win them to Christ, discipleship them, and then train them, and then turn them loose to plant churches. Amen. And that's exactly what we're doing with now. Uh, we have churches going on in Haiti, churches going on in the Dominican Republic, two different countries. We are in the middle of a pandemic. I know COVID-19, but we got four churches trying to kick off at this very moment in Haiti. 
So thank you so much uh, for allowing me to uh, speak tonight. Obviously, my precious uh, wife and children are with me. The last time I was here, I only had zero children. I had zero. We had one? We had zero. <laughs> zero. We had none. And, yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. So, and then obviously we went to the mission field, and then I think it's, it's the mission field. It's all the coconut water in the Dominican Republic, you know. <laughs> but obviously God blesses us, and man, we met at Bible college. We, we got married. She, she's uh, from Alabama. I'm from Haiti. I'm caught in a lot of the story. But we met at Bible college. I got saved at Bible college. Uh, I was soul winning. I was leading people to Christ. Uh, coming back, uh, coming out, coming from a background of charismatic, um, I was what you call religious, but I could never lend, on, if you would, a salvation, a time in my life. And then so at Bible college, as I was studying um, the doctrine of salvation, and came to the clear understanding that my good works could not save me. Uh, I needed to admit that I was a sinner, uh, unclean, undone, and only Christ's death, burial, resurrection could save me. Amen. And that was a struggle for me, but I remember, I, I realized, you know what, if I don't do this, I'm going to go to hell, <laughs> you know? So at Bible college, I made my decision, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. So please pray for us. Um, we are going to be... Uh, flying back to the Dominican Republic Monday from uh, Fort Lauderdale. Um, I have a brother and, if you would, sisters and dad and family relatives in Miami, Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale area. I wanted to spend a little time with him before we go back to the mission field. And this will be our fourth term, uh, being, if you being on the mission field. So uh, please pray for us. We have a lot of goals. Oh, my goodness, I want to see 5,000 people save the next, you know, uh, ten years is, is already in my plan. I put my plan together. I shared that plan with my assistant pastors, church planters, and we all in the same mindset. I want to see at least a thousand uh, bat- uh, five hundred baptism. I, I, I wanted to see at least twenty five brand new churches planted within the next uh, ten years. And all my fellows, we are in the same mindset. And I don't mean I'm going to twist their hands to make, force them to do anything. Uh, my style is, uh, I, I go so when I take my time with people. I want to make sure they understand. I can give you stories after stories. In the Dominican Republic, uh, we had a bunch of kids who were introverted. Uh, that would be 10 years ago. When you see them, you say hello to them. They will literally speak and kind of put their heads down, shy off, and kind of walk away from you. Uh, second generation Haitians in the Dominican Republic uh, don't speak a lick of Creole. All they speak is Spanish. So we started the church. My wife obviously can see the need, and I told her, beloved, would you take the kids, and I'll take all the adults. But I told her, don't try to force them to get saved. I want you to love on them and simply teach them doctrines and, and the Bible story. Let it be that they are the one who come after us, asking us to lead them to Christ. That's exactly what happened. After about a, a year and a half and two years, these kids understood salvation so bad, so much, they would come and say, Pastor, uh, we want to get saved. Would you please uh, lead us to Jesus? We want to go to heaven. We don't want to go to hell. Now what I'm probably says, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, we do. We, we sin as we're going to hell. Uh, if we don't get saved, uh, we, 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 we lost forever. We want to go to heaven. And then obviously that, that, was, that was so clear. We understood. They understood. We will, we will lead them to the Lord. And then secondly, baptism was the same way. I didn't want to force them to get baptized, you know. And so uh, my little daughter, Jacqueline, she was about maybe seven years old at that time, uh, six or seven. And, uh, and, uh, and now she was saved. She is seeing people, you know, people getting baptized at the church. She came to me several times and said, Dad, I, I, I've been saved for several weeks. When are you going to baptize me? You know? And I would say, Jacqueline, you don't know what you're talking about. Just get away from me. You know? Just to make sure that she understood. You know? After about maybe a couple weeks, one day she called me. She says, Dad, when are you going to baptize me? I said, Jacqueline, you don't know what you're talking about, so leave me alone. She said, Dad, I got saved. I know Jesus died for me. He was buried in the cross, was from the dead, and I believe he's the Savior of mankind. He's in my heart. Baptism is simply an external meaning of the fact that I got Christ in my heart. When I'm in the water, that means I know Jesus died for me. When I'm under the water, he was buried. When, he, when I'm up, he was from the dead, and I'm going to go to heaven. 
So what about else? I say, okay, well, I baptize you this Sunday, right? You know, so you know, so when are you gonna do it? You know, so you know, so that's when I say when I say we're gonna see five thousand people saved. I mean, um, our guys understand we all gonna go out as different pastors. We have, uh, if you would, 10, 15, 20 churches. It's all of us put together that's going to reach this goal. And then when people get saved, my approach to it is I, I want them to come to church. I, I want to discipleship them. I want them to become members of our church. It doesn't mean that we're not going to see people get saved who don't come to church. But our goal is we want them to become part, if you would, of the church. So it's a huge goal. Pray for us. I, I do have a need I want you to pray about. Um, we, 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 we need about $8,000 for residence. Brother uh, uh, Tim, understand what residential paperwork is all about. You used to be a missionary in Nigeria. Uh, uh, immigration can be a pain to your neck if you're not careful. You can be in love with Jesus for being a missionary today, and the next day, immigration make you quit. And then you repent, you got what we got, you know. And then the next, I mean, immigration can be some of the, I mean, the worst people to deal with. Uh, so pray that God will bring a few of that uh, funds for us. Open your Bibles with me quickly, if you would. Genesis uh, chapter 31. We're going to read in verse 1 and also verse uh, 2. Genesis 31. I'm going to read two verses. Uh, and then we will get into a Bible study for tonight. The Bible says this, And he heard the words of Laban's sons. He, speaking about Jacob, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this, this glory. Verse 2. And Jacob beheld, I want you to highlight this statement, and Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not told him as before. Jacob had acquired great glory as an employee working for Laban. Glory here means several things. Number one, it means an increase of wealth. It means an increase of servants. Number three, an increase of cattle. And number four, an increase of materialistic power because wealth gives you what you call power. It means, number five, great success and the business of whatever you are involved in. Number six, it also means you become so successful, you have gone past your boss or your, employee, your employer. In other words, you become so successful, if your employer is not careful, you might even give him a job. <laughs> it happened to be that Jacob heard the sons of Laban talking about him. Because the obvious fact that he, Jacob, who was an employee of Laban, has become so successful that Laban can actually become an employee working with uh, Jacob. And Laban's children, sons, uh, were sitting there thinking of the reality of what just took place, uh, and they did not like it. They were talking about Jacob's glory. The, the statement they made was that Jacob took away all that was their fathers. Because in their mind, they remember when Jacob came, he came with a little stick in his hand. That's all he had. But now, he has so much cattle, so much servants, so much money. He has so much, if you would, wealth. He had no place, if you would, to put them. And so in their thinking, the only way Jacob got what he, what he had was the fact that he stole it from their father. And they said it was, it, it was out of, our, of what our father had. He got all, his, they said, his glory. To those guys, Jacob was a bad dude. You get that? They did not like what they think he did to their father. 
If he took away all that, they found if they found they had, that means uh, there was nothing left for them. Those guys did not like Jacob deep in their heart. Uh, he, even, even though they were his brother-in-law, even though when they see him from day to day, they will say hello to him. But deep in their heart, there was hatred. There was something going on to the point that uh, when they see him, their face, their countenance was not the same toward him as it used to be. Before, Laban's countenance used to be gracious, loving, kind, pleasant, sweet. In fact, it was Laban when he saw Jacob for the first time who picked him up and danced with him because he was obviously, if you were his nephew. In fact, it was Laban when obviously Jacob was making him money. That, that, that love, that love, if you would, the wealth he was getting from Jacob's labor. He wanted him to stay longer with him. So in those days, every time Laban saw Jacob, he would say, man, put it right there, buddy. Good to see you because you know what? You're making me money. Man, you know what? Man, you're the greatest son-in-law. Man, good to see. That, that was, if you would, his face, his countenance, if you would, uh, toward uh, Jacob. You see, Laban was not pleased to see and know that Jacob became greater than he was. When things were going, if you would, good for him and bad for Jacob, he was happy. But when things began to go bad for him but good for Jacob, obviously he is unhappy and it reflected, if you would, uh, in his face. Let me read a couple scripture passages quickly uh, uh, from the, the Bible uh, so you can understand the, 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 the countenance is a mirror of what truthfully is going on in their heart. Uh, in Proverbs 15, 13, the Bible says, a cheerful countenance uh, revealed uh, that we have a, a, a merry heart. But at the same time, if, 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 if we, a, a broken spirit also is manifested in the, if you would, the face. Genesis chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, Cain, a countenance revealed that, uh, uh, if you would, uh, there was something wrong in his heart. And that he had anger. When God spoke to him, his countenance falling over the fact that God accepted his brothers, if you would, the offering, but his was rejected. And for Samuel 1, 18, Hannah's countenance revealed that she was broken hearted to the point that she looks like she was drunk and Eli misunderstood what he saw on, if he would, on, on her face until she Set me like straight to say, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just simply a broken-hearted wo woman. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 2. Nehemiah's countenance revealed that if you were deep in his heart, he was broken-hearted when he can see all that was going on. And his, if he would homeland among his own people, how that the city of Jerusalem was completely destroyed. He could not hide it from within. Psalms chapter 10, verse 4. The countenance of the wicked revealed that he has pride deep in his heart and therefore he will not seek after God. He is cocky and arrogant. In Psalms 42, 11, 43, 5, David's countenance revealed that his soul was cast down and he needed, if you would, God to lift him up. So what I'm saying is this, Laban deep in his heart had a problem with Jacob and he could not hide it. His face reveals it. But when God, who was the God of Jacob, he sees their heart. You see, men may not know what's going on in your heart. You may try to hide it, but God knows your heart. Amen. You see, when God can see what was going on, he can see Laban would hold Jacob if he's not careful. So he spoke to Jacob and tell him, go back to your homeland, to your father land. Go back to your tangents because if you, that's the place where you are going to be loved. You're not loved here anymore. Uh, you, 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 your uncle's heart has turned, if you would, against you. He used to be for you. He used to love you. He, he used to appreciate you. But now, he does not, if you would, love you anymore. His heart has taken a different direction. And so God says, get up, go back home. Uh, and when you get home, you're going to get with people that actually care about you. 
God knew that it would be not be good for Jacob to leave with Laban because he can see that both Laban and his sons had problem in their heart with Jacob, and if he did nothing, they will hurt Jacob. Quickly, my time is running fast. Here's my proposition. What is this passage of scripture tonight teaching us? Number one, it is saying to us that when our heart is with someone, we need to be careful that it does not turn against them. Number two, it is saying that once our heart, or your heart, my heart, turn against someone with whom we used to be with or for, it is impossible to hide it. You know, in the story of, of Adam and Eve being in the garden, and, and the fact that there was a true communion and unity between God, if you would, and Adam and Eve, and if you would, and men. And what happened when uh, Satan came and turned, if you would, Eve's heart against God, and turned Adam's heart against God. We don't have the time to go into the details, but obviously what all Satan did was to convince Eve that God was keeping something good away from her. That's all he did. That's all he did. God is keeping something good away from you. And suddenly Eve began to think evil, ill thoughts toward God. He, she began to think, if you would, in a negative way toward God. And the next thing you know, her heart was torn, if you would, against God. Absalom, the Bible says, stole the heart, if you would, of the people against God. Paul was fearful. He was worried in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, in 11, over the fact that the devil can come and, if you would, and, and beguile the heart of the believers of the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, what he's saying is this. They're already in love with Christ. He was jealous over them with a godly jealousy. Why? Because the enemy may come and turn their heart away from Christ. Let me get into details, into where we live. My brother, we need to be careful as brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't let the devil turn our hearts away from our pastors. It's very easy to do. When you first got saved, you joined the church. When you come to the church, you love the preaching of the pastor. Everything the pastor did was wonderful, sweet, and kind. Anything you said, you left at. To you, it was if you were the honeymoon. You go into the community, you talk about this amazing church you found. And then watch out because the enemy knows exactly how to turn your heart away from those whom you love. All he will do, listen to me, all he will do is he will, he will send somebody towards your path to make you to begin to think negative thought about if you were that leader. Listen to me. If you are with the men of God, you need, you, 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 you need to make sure that you watch your heart. The Bible says, uh, God the heart with all diligence for all of it are the issues uh, of life. What he's saying is this. If I'm for the men of God uh, in my presence, don't talk bad about him. If, I, if I'm in, I'm in all the way. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm in for the men of God, there's just no way I'm going to sit there and watch you talking bad and negative about him, not being part of it. If you're not careful, I will knock your teeth off. All I'm trying to do is I'm trying to protect my heart. I had uh, quickly on the mission field uh, several stories, if you would, that I could tell you about. I had a young man in our church. His name is uh, Fennel. This guy, I led him to do a load. One day I was in my balcony in my house when I first got to the mission field. As I sat there and studied my Bible and singing and reading, you know, uh, just if you would pray, I watched across the street. Uh, there is uh, about two Jehovah Witnesses every week. They come in and crossing over and going to have Bible study with this young man while in front of my house. And then I had not yet known him yet. Uh, he was, if you would, a stranger to me. But, you know, when you are a uh, fundamental Baptist, you were trained from the place where I came from. There, there is fight. Some, there is some fight inside of you. And I'm thinking, sitting there, I just know I'm going to sit here and watch these guys come and convert this young boy and take him away. And then it's, it's almost like the Holy Spirit says, man, don't you have any fight inside of you? So I, I got, it, got up, he went downstairs and crossed the street, found this young man and, and met him and introduced myself. His name was Fennel. And I said, Fennel, do you believe all the stuff these people were saying? He said, you know what? I've been thinking about all the stuff they're saying. It sounds crazy to me. I said, yeah, to me too. Let me show you the truth. Amen. And show him about salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen. How he could be saved, and he got saved. Amen. He became a bus captain. 
and then he became a, super, a Sunday school superintendent. He became a bus driver. I mean, one of those guys, guys who had tremendous potential to become a pastor. And then Satan began to walk in his heart. You know, as I left the Dominican Republic once a month to travel to Haiti, to go and coach our guys in Haiti, that's a 10-hour trip driving. It used to be when Fennel sees me, he had a big smile on his face. Hey, Pastor, welcome. Hey, man, good to see you. You know, how was your trip? I mean, a big smile. But slowly, I began to see that smile drift away to the point when he sees me, his head was down. And I said, Fennel, are you okay? And as I got deeper into his life and I found out he was in trouble, and as I tried to help him, he tell me, that's my private life. Leave me alone. And I warned him. And I said, Fennel, if you're not careful, I'm afraid for you. Because you can see Satan is going to tore you apart. I said, Fennel, please repent. Get your life right. Don't go this path. Don't go this way. He didn't listen to me. He ended up in the, if you would, maximum security prison in Haiti. In the prison, he will win people to Christ. In the prison, he'll be talking about me, the pastor who won him. What happened is this, folks. Our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it but whom? The Lord. What I'm saying is this. My heart is weak. Your heart is weak. So when it comes to the man of God quickly is this. We need to work God around our heart so that we, we do not, if you would stand with him today and then tomorrow we drift, if you would, against him. And one of the ways the devil steal our heart away from the man of God, listen to me, is, is, is what we're listening to on the internet from different, if you would, preachers out there. Sometimes they call them prophets. They can prophesy. They can have dreams, all kind of crazy nonsense. And so you're being fed somewhere else and you come to the church. Now, if you would, when they're preaching, if you would, is being preached behind the pulpit, your heart is not worth what the man of God is saying anymore. Secondly, be careful, not only with the men of God, but with God himself. You know, it's amazing to watch a new convert come to Christ. They are so happy, so hungry, so thirsty, so excited. In fact, at Bible college, I saw a young man like that. He came to Bible college. I was at Bible college, a student like him, zealous, excited for the Lord. Back in those days, uh, the college would go and find jobs for all the students, and then they found me a job, and this young man happened to be working in the same place with me, not just me, a bunch of the college students together. And so as we were working, I mean, we were always having a good time together. We stayed together because we are working, if you would, uh, in an environment where there is, if you would, all kind of different, you know, if, uh, people. But one day I didn't see this young guy. And so we began to wonder about two or three days we didn't see him. And the next day when he came to work, he had duct tape in his ears. We couldn't understand what was going on. And duct tape right here in his chain. We couldn't understand what was going on. And then the day after he took it off, he had earrings. And, and in his tongue, another earring. And tattoos. And we said, whoa, we were so shocked. What, what, what's going on? I thought you were in Bible college. He says, no. He said, I had a talk with uh, the college president, uh, Wendell Evans, back in those days, and I told him, look, man, I, he says, I love God and I also love the world, too. And he says, well, uh, Dr. Evans says, I can have both. I need to make a choice. And he says, well, in that case, he says, well, I love the world more than God, so I decided to go the world the world. You see, his heart is turned away from following God. At one time, he was zealous. At one time, he was happy and excited, singing, giving glory and honor, if you would, to the Lord Jesus Christ. At one time, he wanted to be a preacher, preaching the gospel of the everlasting, if you would, uh, 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 Christ. At, at, at one time, he truthfully wanted to make, if you would, a difference in this world below. But the devil slowly creeped into his heart until he stole his affection. Now he no longer loved Christ, he loved something else called what? The world. 
Finally, we need to guard our hearts for our mates. Women, be careful with your heart. If you have a secular job at you at your work, these guys, you know, they when 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 they see a pretty woman, they they they, they, they like to tell her she's pretty. And then not only so, when they see a modest, godly, decent, if you were a woman, to them, that's what they would like to have. Obviously, they cannot have. Are you listening to me? If you're not careful, they're going to steal your heart away from your husband. Men, vice versa, we, we need to keep our heart, if you would, faithful to our wives. Be careful with other women. Go, you know, I don't know, walking by, calling you, you know, handsome, good looking, you know, a chunky, chunk. I don't know what they call you. But listen to me, the, the, the compliment that I want, if you would, of my look, my handsomeness, whatever it is, should only come from one woman, that is, if you would, my wife. Because if you're not careful, if you would, there, there's women out there that knows how to steal the heart of a man. Every woman knows the way to the heart of a man is his belly. Yeah. Fellas, be careful about eating from women out there. Will it? And the next thing you know, you don't like your wife cooking, you don't like the way she dresses, you don't like the way she fits the house because in your mind you're thinking about somebody else because your heart has been turned away from the one you once loved. So here's my conclusion for the sake of time is this. Imagine Laban. At one time, he truly embraced Jacob. They danced. They were happy. Welcome, my nephew. 20 years later, when it was time for Jacob to leave, he had to, listen to this, run away behind Laban's back. That's how bad the relationship got. That's how deteriorate, if you would, the relationship becomes. Because Laban's heart was no longer with Jacob. You can see it. And so tonight, my conclusion to you is this. If your heart is not with your husband, I hope you will get it right. If your heart is not with your wife, I hope you will get it right. If your heart is not with you, mom and dad, get it right. If your heart is not with your children, get it right. If your heart is not with God, get it right. If your heart is, 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 is not with your church, get it right. If it's not with the pastor, get it right. Look, we are living in a time of pandemic. If there is a time where the church needs to get their heart right with God, it's now. Yes, sir. Are you listening to me? If there's a time where we need to get closer to Christ so that we, 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 we understand, we look up, if you will, to the Savior for our salvation instead of to the government or to the CDC, to what's going on out there, it's not. Listen to me. The world will love to steal our love and affection away from Christ Jesus. You know how, how they will do it? They will promise that they will be the one who brings you salvation. Yeah. Our salvation is not in this world below. Yeah. I don't mean salvation to be saved. I mean healing, I mean protection, I mean security, I mean whatever it is that we're looking for. I thought Psalms, if you were 91 says, if you would, the Bible says, I will lift up my, uh, Psalms 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, um, he says, uh, 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 shall dwell in the, uh, the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 121, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Yes, God can use the government to give me the solution that I need, but I should not look to them, I should look up to God. We need to be careful we don't let, if you would, Satan or the world steal our affection away from the Savior. That's what Paul meant when he was speaking to the church of Corinth. I'm jealous over you because I can see the enemy is messing with your heart. He's pulling you away. You have one husband. His name is Jesus Christ. If you have hope, you need help, you go to Christ. Your world is upside down. This pandemic, CNN, and uh, I don't know, CBN, every one of them. They're messing your brain up. You don't know if you're up, down, you know where you are. Get closer to Christ. Amen. That's all we can do. Amen. Our love and affection is to the Savior. Amen. Not this world below. Amen. Would you please bow your heads Amen. and close your eyes. Amen. And let's pray.
Father, thank you so much for the privilege to speak tonight. You would, a local body of believers, the local church, Lord, someday we know the trumpet will sound. And no matter where we are, no matter what the body, local body is, we are going to rise up and go meet you up in the air. And we all will be one worldwide. What a glorious day that will be. And I pray tonight, Lord, until that time come, help each local assembly of believers be more affectionate towards you, more than ever. Lord, don't let the enemy mess with our mind and our thinking, our spirit and soul. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to have understanding, eyes to see, ears to hear. Help us to learn tonight what took place between Laban and, and, and Jacob can also take place between us and you. And that is our heart can turn away from you. And that's not your will. You desire, you will, you plan is that we will be true and faithful to you. Help us to see that tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, heads about bowed, eyes are closed. Let's let the Lord have his way in our hearts. As the music plays in just a moment, let's all stand. Use the altar, however God is dealing with your heart, whatever you need to do, talk about. Let the Lord deal with your heart about any way of drifting away from the Lord, away from the church, away from your family. Be obedient to the Lord and let God have his way in your heart. Now, if you need someone to pray with you as you come, let us know what the need is so we can help you. Go ahead and be seated. That was worth waiting on. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Biz. Appreciate that. Hey, uh, uh, let's see. Food tonight? There is food tonight. Let's find out about some birthdays. And then Saturday morning. Uh, Saturday morning. We need more people out on Saturday, knocking on some doors, helping out on a bus route, working on your Sunday school, kids or whatever, bus kids. And so be here on Saturday morning at 9.30, all right? And if you can make it to the Six Jeppers Fellowship week from this Saturday, talk to Mrs. Green. Let her know that you're going to be able to come, okay? Brother Aaron, is Aaron in here? Well, I guess, Brother Tim, you're the song leader. Let's see. I know we have two birthdays, and one just escaped. Oh, oh, it's Caleb's birthday coming up also. Three days, yes. And Brother Henry, anyone else? All right. Birthdays this week, or we missed you last week. Anybody?
right, let's sing to them on that. Uh, let's see, who's got an anniversary? Anybody have an anniversary this week or we missed you last week? Anniversary? Who's that, the Eccles? No, who? Garrett's? Is it y'all's? Come on down here. Brother Andre and Miss Crystal, come on down. Anybody else? Anybody else? You can point out them if they point them out if they don't raise their hand. All right, let's sing happy anniversary to the Garrett's. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Garrett's are one of the sweetest couples in the church. Thank the Lord for both their lives. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's see. So we have food tonight. Make sure that you come by and let the Larice family know. We appreciate them coming long distance. And then pray for their safety as they're headed down Fort Lauderdale. I guess tomorrow maybe headed that direction. And, uh, and then they're going to be taking off a week from this coming Monday. This coming Monday headed to Dominican, so pray for their safety, okay? Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we sure love you, and we're thankful for the good grace of God in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Brother Biz and his family all this distance to be able to share the word of God with us tonight. I pray, Father, even as they're going back to the mission field, that you give them great power and unction. We pray for all of his family and their safety, God. We live in uncertain times, but we're thankful, Lord, that even in uncertain times, you're the one that we can look to and trust in. We pray that you'd meet their different needs, physical as well as spiritual and financial needs. We pray, Father, you'd even help our church to have a greater burden for the people of Dominican as well as Haiti. Help us to have a greater love for the gospel. And I pray you'd bless as we go our separate ways. Keep us safe and bring us back to the church on, on the weekend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.